I'm on a journey to get better and I want to do it with you. And I'm not just focusing on physical health. I'm focusing on everything, emotional wellness, spirituality, finances, relationships, and so much more. Every week, it will be my personal goal to bring us, the world's leading healers, experts, and game changers to share groundbreaking secrets and tips to getting better in all areas of life. Getting better isn't easy, but it's a whole lot easier when we can do it together. Welcome to Better Together with me, Maria Menounos. Hello, hello, everybody. Happy Monday. Hope you guys are doing well wherever you are. Welcome back to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. Our quote of the day, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning how to dance in the rain. That's by Vivian Green. Okay. <laughs> Guess we're going to be doing a lot of dancing right now. Dance in the rain. You know, that quote under normal circumstances would get me. But right now, <laughs> I don't know about dancing in the rain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this one's a little tougher. <laughs> These are, are a little bit of, of a different kind of time. Um, I don't know about you guys, but, um, you know, it, I've been kind of on a little bit of a roller coaster of emotions and you know, I'll just share, um, I'll share a little bit about that. Um, because as I've said for the last, I don't know how many weeks we've been doing this or two weeks or whatever. Um, this is a space that I have opened up for all of us every day to be able to come together and have, you know, a safe kind of sane place where we're not spreading lies and misinformation and hysteria. We're just being real and, um, trying to bring light to a really, difficult situation. And so, uh, the real of it is I, I definitely have been struggling trying to keep a good state and trying to, um, control my emotions. Oh boy. Here we go. Fudge. Here we go. Um, you can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Hold it back. I think, um, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, when you see how much people are suffering and we're going to get to our amazing guest today, AJ Gupta is going to help you navigate the big emotional part of this. There are two emotional parts. It's like our health and our, our livelihoods, right. Have been affected. And so we're going to help you guys through this storm of, of, you know, economical issues, but on the kind of human level, you know, you're seeing doctors and nurses who are socialing out and there are people who aren't believing what's going on out there, by the way. Um, and, and that is a little disappointing, but you know, some of these that I pulled were really disturbing me, you know, Cornelia Griggs, my babies are too young to read this now and they'd barely recognize me in my gear. But if they lose me to COVID, oh, frig, this is the first one I had to start with. I want them to know my mommy tried really hard to do her job. And there is a photo of her. Another person, my mom is a 69-year-old nurse and her hospital is deploying her to the front lines next week. She called to tell me where important documents are if something happens because this virus kills and it kills quick. Now I know how it feels to have a loved one go to war. Another doctor, I intubated, intubated my colleague today, a young, healthy ER doc like me. Dear fellow colleagues, this is another doctor, when you're about to intubate, this killed me. This killed me. When you're about to intubate a COVID patient, will you please slow down and ask them if they have any words for their beloved ones? The data shows about 30% of them, unfortunately, may never have the chance to say I love you again. I lost it hysterically um, reading some of these tweets this weekend. And, you know, it's, it's hard for me to deal. And I don't know if I just have an issue with, you know, being alone. <laughs> I, I definitely have been left in a hospital alone a few times. And so I, I think I have a little bit of trauma around that. And maybe I still need to do some more EMDR work there. But the idea that from the lowest of levels, mothers are having to give birth alone, which is a very difficult thing and not really how you envision a very special moment in your life, uh, to the worst where your loved one, like a friend of ours this morning, had to you know, their family member had to be rushed to the hospital and, you know, they can't be with them. That friggin' kills me. That's yeah, really rough. And so it's been really, really hard 
to stay positive throughout this because it's only going to get worse. This is where we're supposed to kind of hit our our peak, right? In these next two, three weeks, I think, is when it's going to, you know, kind of rise for us. And I don't know, it just, I, I look around my house and I just think I've worked so hard to keep my parents alive. And if something like this is to happen, God, it would really suck. <laughs> and, you know, I do believe that our lives are written and I believe that, you know, it all happens as it's supposed to, but that would really freaking suck. <laughs> and I really feel so bad for people out there who are suffering, whether they're going down to one meal a day because they can't feed their families. And I was reading a lot of accounts like that this weekend of people who haven't received a paycheck and, you know, they were living paycheck to paycheck because that's just how it is for some people. You know, you're a waiter or a waitress or whatever your job is. And, you know, people are already getting hungry in our country. Like, I know we already had issues, um, but, you know, it's it's becoming more widespread. So that was really getting me big time this weekend. And then I would meditate and I would get myself to a good place again. And, you know, our my favorite, Tony Robbins, had um, some beautiful videos that, you know, I was watching about... Um, this morning talking about decisions and, you know, decisions is another word for choices, I think too. And we always end the show with make good choices. And he said that, you know, decisions are what control our lives and it's our decisions about what to believe, our decisions about what to do. And the biggest decision that you can make is to choose to live in a beautiful state. And that's why meditation is so important because we are choosing in that moment to be present and to bring ourselves to a better state. And he does a lot of work in his seminars about getting us into state. And, you know, the decision that I'm not going to suffer, you know, pain is a different thing than suffering. And so you can stop the suffering by focusing on something that you want to serve that's greater than yourself, whether it's your family, your mission or whatever. And, and so choosing to, to not suffer is a big thing. And so after my surgery, I, I really started learning how to shift, right? So I can shift out of emotions pretty quickly. Like if you're really depressed and Tony talks about it in his seminars, he'll pull, point someone out. And so he'll like, okay, you're depressed. If I gave you a million dollars right now, or if I did something, I took you to Disneyland, how would you feel? Well, I feel great. Well, look how easy it is to shift your state. And so, um, the Dodo helped me shift my state after those doctor, um, you know, uh, tweets, and it was a beautiful little animal video and it made me so happy. And I retweeted that. Um, and then this morning, as I was finishing up a call, helping a friend whose uh, grandfather was being rushed to the hospital, um, I saw a really beautiful story. And I wanted to share that with you because again, and I talked about this in a social post this weekend, this is where we see the beauty in humanity, right? So Stephen, we're having really dark times, whether it was 9-11 or whatever we go through, it, it can be horrible and amazing at the same time because you see the beauty of humanity. And so Columbia Sportswear CEO, Tim Boyle, who we are going to try to find and track down for the show, literally cut his salary to $10,000 a year to be able to keep his employees, 3,500 retail employees were at risk of losing their jobs or not getting paid. Now they will continue to receive their regular paychecks. It's a company that's been in business for 81 years. Um, it's mostly owned by the Boyle family, apparently, and they've had crisis before, and they've weathered that storm by standing together, together, and that's, of course, what they say is the culture of their company. But this guy is such an incredible example of decisions <laughs> and, and choices, and he is doing that for the greater good of his company and his employees, and I think it's another moment of light that we can like grab onto and hold on to. And so that's what I'm going to hold on to today as Amazon and Instacart have both gone on strike. All the employees, by the way, if you haven't heard, um, you know, we've really subsisted on Amazon at this point when we need something last minute. So we don't have to go into CVS if we don't have to for actual medications. Um, but I imagine Amazon will fix this very quickly. 
it's just a lot of criticism is due for some of these businesses because, you know, if you're bringing in a billion in, in the red, like in, pro, in main profits, or even like 300, 500 million in the, in the red main profits after salaries, what is that money for if not to get through the harder times mm-hmm. when, the, when they come? And that's why it's so asinine when Jeff Bezos has his fundraiser for Amazon workers. When you're like, everyone's using you now. Stocks are up $150. <laughs> Amazon stocks are higher than what they were actually predicting three months ago. Mm-hmm. Because usually it hits 2100 then drops to $1,700. they are yep. at 1959 right now. It's like, do you really need a fundraiser for your workers? No, yeah. you need to reexamine where you've been putting all that rainy day fund. Well, you need to get them some hand sanitizer and some gloves. And if you are receiving packages at home, I highly suggest that you're washing everything that you're you're receiving, you know, with a, a Lysol or, a, you know, some kind of um, yeah. alcohol swab or wipe or something. Because, again, these workers are testing positive for COVID-19, and they're the ones that are packaging things and sending them to us. So we have to be careful. Yeah, it attaches to cardboard for 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, I think it's metal for two to three days or something like that. Yeah. I'd have to look it up. But yeah, cardboard 24 hours. So uh, so that is that is my my thoughts and feelings in the current moments and the last couple of days and some uh, some good news, uh, which is very, um, very much needed. And so um, with that done, I want to jump right into our chat with AJ Gupta. You know, at this time, so many hardworking people are out of work and um, this virus is ripping through this global economy and really wiping out um, whatever's left in people's accounts. And so I asked AJ to take time out of his busy schedule today to help us figure out how to help people at kind of all levels right now. Because, you know, I know people who have a little bit of a nest egg and are thinking, should I jump in and invest? I know people who um, have absolutely nothing left and are trying to figure out how they're going to keep their home. Um, And so I want to be able to see if we can get takeaway for every level of person right now. And, um, and we're going to be continuing to do that um, as much as we can. So AJ Gupta, thank you so much for taking the time. Hi, Maria. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. I, uh, I'm good. I'm going to be even better hearing all of the amazing takeaway that you're going to give us for our listeners today. Wonderful. So for people who are out of work, um, and don't really have a lot of options in terms of employment right now, what do you say to those people who, you know, were living paycheck to paycheck, let's say, and, you know, most Americans don't have enough for a $400 health bill, generally speaking. Um, now it's, you know, it's even worse. Time. There's so much pain and suffering going on right now, not just like what happened 10 years ago when people were worried just about their finances. Now people are worried about their health and the health of their loved ones and they're quarantined. And there's a whole bunch of other aspects of being quarantined in your home right now is number one, for those that have run out of work, the the president did sign into law on Friday, uh, the CARES Act. And there's lots of moving parts with this. And I'm still trying to get my arms around it, but I thought I'd just, I took some notes that I'd share with you a couple things. First of all, the plan provides $1,200 for each adult and 500 for each child under 17. A married couple with two children would get $3,400. Most people will receive the money in a payment from the IRS real soon. And now people are asking who qualifies for the program? How does it work? The payments will go to almost any adult with a social security number, as long as they aren't dependents of someone else. Those adults get the, get the payments for the children in their household. So just to kind of give you an idea what some of those numbers look like and how it works and when do you get phased out uh, if you are not eligible, uh, payments start phasing out for those with income above $75,000 in what's called adjusted gross income, or it's also called AGI if I want to use a technical term, and $112,500 for heads of household, often single parents, and couples with $150,000 of income. At those levels, the payments start shrinking. For those with no children, 
the benefit disappears at 99,000 and 198,000 for married couples. So this is all new. So if you uh, make 198,000, you don't get anything. That is correct. Yeah. As a, as a married couple, if you make less than 99,000 as an individual, you will start getting it. And they're, they're putting together calculators. And for those, as the information is still coming available, you can go to www.irs.gov forward slash coronavirus. If you go to it right now, the information is still not there uh, as we speak, but they're putting information up and available so people can start understanding and getting their arms around what who benefits and how to access those funds. Yeah. How quickly do you think they'll be able to distribute? I think it's going to take at least a month as the way wow. I'm, just, I'm getting several sources. I know they're going to go as quickly as possible, but just to distribute those kind of funds, it's going to take several weeks at least. So how do you survive in the meantime? Right. So number one, for those of you, first of all, you need to put yourself on a strict, strict budget. It's not about what you want, but it's all about what you need. And I'm seeing people across the board. I'm reading articles. I'm speaking with people. This time you want to be very thoughtful about what you're spending every dollar. I'm hoping that many people have enough food at home to take care of the main essentials. I realize that that's not the case for everyone out there right now. I can't stress how important it is to really, uh, you know, practice social distancing. That's a terminology that, that I did not even know existed just one month ago. And now it's a household term, but it's so important that you avoid people right now because not only do you not want to get sick, you don't want to pass it on to others. Uh, if you're watching the news, pretty much everyone is saying that right now. Um, don't waste any food that's in the house. Um, you can talk to your, if you're renting right now, do reach out to your landlord and just ask if there's any, if you don't have the capability of making this month's rent payment, just ask, what can you do? What can they do to accommodate? The government is stepping in and creating programs for landlords and borrowers to give some type of um, some type of extension to mortgage payments. So my thoughts are if you are unable to make your rent payment this month, if you're a renter, please reach out to your landlord. And if you are a landlord or if you own a home and you have a mortgage that you're not able to make, please reach out to your bank. A lot of this will, a lot of these programs will be uh, processed through the banking system. Yeah, I think I remember seeing something last week where all the banks came together and they were going to protect people with mortgages for a certain time, Bank of America being the only one that wasn't joining that. Hopefully that has changed. But um, I imagine if you are in a situation with a landlord now, I think across the country, they're not allowing any evictions or is it just in California? You know, the program is being rolled across the country. I know that I was on a call just this weekend where, for example, owners of apartment buildings where they have, you know, tenants inside their property and they're unable to make their uh, rent payment, the, the government programs will allow um, the landlord, the owner, to not make his mortgage payment uh, for the next three months. Uh, but in, in agreement, they will have to make the payment over the next 12 months. So there is a catch-up provision. But they're not supposed to let, they're not supposed to evict anyone because of healthcare reasons. They lost their job or they have to stay home because children cannot go to school. So they're trying to make the program, um, they're trying to give breaks to the landlords, but as long as the landlords are giving breaks to their tenants. Yeah. So this is all new. People are trying to get their arms around it to make sure that it doesn't get abused. And the people that really need the help are getting that help. Yeah. So what are some practical ways people can... Um, are there other programs that you can access right now if you have nothing right now while you wait for that check from the government, that $1,200, let's say, check? Can you get on welfare, food stamps? Are there other programs that they can access right now? Obviously, if you've been laid off of work, you can get unemployment, right? Right, right. Absolutely. My thoughts are as you go through all of them, and this is the time we're all at home. If you're not working right now and you're and you need funds available, definitely applying for unemployment. You could apply for welfare. There's food stamps. There's certain criteria that you can go towards that. Um, if you have loans or credit card debt, I would reach out to the people that uh, that you owe money to and just ask for any type of assistance or maybe a delayed payment. And once again, it starts at home. You really want to make sure that you're not wasting any money uh, on things that are not. Uh, absolute necessities as we go through this difficult winter period right now. Uh, for those of you, you can also, if you do have any savings within 401ks or outside of 401ks, 
if absolutely necessary, you could tap into those right now uh, to kind of get you through this difficult period. We are guiding and advising people if you don't need to access those funds, uh, this is uh, an ideal time to stay invested and stay the course because uh, you know, there was no real place to hide uh, with this market correction over the last several weeks. So if you could stay invested and, and be able to participate in the eventual recovery, that's ideal. But I understand that's not reality and it's wishful thinking that some people do need to reach in. And if you are reaching into your retirement accounts for emergency funds, try tapping into more of the the allocation that was maybe towards high quality government bonds. And if you could avoid selling the piece that was invested in equities or the stock market piece at these levels, I'd highly encourage that. So let's talk about 401ks, right? So if you had for your 401k was your primary, um, you know, savings, and right. now it's gone, will that come back? And, and what do you do? So when you say gone, Maria, my thinking is, is is this is temporary. I never want to confuse the word temporary volatility with permanent loss of capital. So if you had the average 401k that I've seen across the country where you're diversified a basket of mutual funds or index funds, clearly the portion that was long-term growth oriented has dropped 20, 30, 40%, depending on how you were invested. And the safety part of it, if it was government bonds or high quality bonds, kind of stayed stable. If it was government bonds, they actually went up a little bit in value. So for those of you that have a diversified portfolio and do not need to tap into those funds to get through this difficult period, I would say, number one, let's try to not make any emotional decisions. It's extremely tempting as you're reading the news and all the negative uh, things that we're seeing and reading, you feel like, oh my goodness, maybe I should just liquidate my 401k, and go to cash and wait on the sidelines. And when things get better, then let me jump in. I would highly encourage you not to do that because you have to make that timing decision twice, when to get out and when to get back in. And most people that do get out usually do not get back in at lower values. Uh, they usually don't get back in, unfortunately, or they get back in at substantially higher investments. And nobody wants to sell something and then buy back for a higher price. It's just the, the, the behavioral part of it, you don't want to do that. And to take it one step further, uh, which is the hardest thing to do uh, as human beings being investors is the portion of the portfolio that's down the equity piece if you could rebalance your portfolio meaning literally exactly what you don't want to hear is sell those high quality or reduce those high quality government bonds that have stayed stable or have actually gone up in value reduce those somewhat and add it to the equity markets that are down 20 30 40 percent it doesn't feel good especially if you feel the world is coming to an end. But we will at some point get through this. And I'm guiding clients to rebalance their portfolios and take advantage of this market pullback. I tell them, my disclaimer is, we might regret this next week. We might regret this next month. But I strongly believe that when we recover, and we will recover, is we will not regret it then. And is it going to be six months? Is it going to be one year? Will it be two years? No one really knows that. But I do believe is I would not bet against this country. And we've gone through difficult periods in the past, and we've always found a way to get back out of it. So I'm really grateful that I read Tony Robbins' Money Master the Game and Unshakable when I did four years ago. I highly recommend it to everyone listening because when you start to understand the mechanisms behind all of this, you realize that it's just a, a cycle, right? Bear market, bull market, bear market, bull market. And, um, and that, you know, obviously knowledge is power. So once you understand it, you have a little bit more faith that things, um, will be restored. And so if you could explain to people how, how that works, how you can be unshakable in a time like this, if you do have stuff invested, money invested in the markets, you know, the, the airline industry will come back eventually. There's no way we're never going to travel again. So all of these things are going to come back up. Um, and, and so if your portfolio is down now, explain how it's going to come back up and, and that whole process. Because what you were saying before of pulling out because you're scared and not knowing when to get back in, you're going to lose twice. You already lost money in the market and now you're pulling out lower and you're going to have to go in higher. You've completely just 
ruined everything that you had been trying for from fear. And as you know, no good decision comes from fear. Right. So Marie, I think in regards to you know, your portfolio, I, I'm getting calls from clients. AJ, should we buy this airline or that airline? Because it'll recover. Our thoughts are, is we will be traveling again. We will be flying again. We will be staying at hotels. We will be going to restaurants for dining. But the risk here right now, is since, since we don't know exactly how long this will last, there are companies that are going to file bankruptcy. That's what I was going to ask you. I was just writing that. What happens to the ones that go bankrupt? Like if American well, Airlines, if I if I decided as an investor, well, American Airlines stock is down, I could buy it now. If it goes bankrupt, what happens? Right. So the way we look at it is, is we don't know which companies will go bankrupt, but we believe that the economy will recover and people will go back to their regular, somewhat of their regular behavior as dining out, flying, traveling, staying at hotels. We would rather own the index funds uh, where owning the actual, and I'll use an example for from 10 years ago from the Great Recession. Um, so in the Great Recession, some of the banks started failing. Lehman Brothers collapsed, uh, Washington Mutual collapsed. Uh, a lot of these big banks collapsed, but the banking system stayed intact. Now, anybody that was trying to pick the individual companies like saying, oh my goodness, Washington Mutual is a big bank. I have my mortgage with them. Let me buy that. Or let me buy Lehman Brothers shares. Those shares actually went to zero and people permanently lost their capital. Wow. But those investors that believe that the financial system will thrive, well, when some of these banks fail, other banks pick, pick up their market share. And when things recover, not only did their prices recover, but they also have expanded uh, market share. So if, for example, if you own the S&P 500 index, which would be, 500 largest companies in the United States. Now that's not a way to, it's not like stopping there building your portfolio. You want to be globally diversified, uh, US, non-US, large companies, small companies, medium-sized companies. But if you have a globally diversified basket, then you're not taking the risk of individual companies. What you are believing is the airlines will recover, the banking system will recover, the uh, industrials will recover. And that way when one company does fail, another company will benefit from the increased market share. So number one is make sure that you've got a plan. Number two is make sure Now, some people are very sophisticated. They could do it themselves. Other people need advice. And if you do need advice, make sure that you're working with what's called a fiduciary, an advisor that's not necessarily truly a salesman where they get commissions and there could be lots of conflicts of interests. Ideally, you want to be working with an advisor um, who's charging a fully transparent advisory fee and that they're giving you counsel. And regardless of what they recommend to you, if they're recommending a XYZ fund or ABC fund, they're not receiving any compensation, it's just removing those conflicts. But once you've come up with a plan in how much do you have today? When do you want to retire? How much money do you need when you retire? And then once you have that investment strategy, just make sure that you're regularly rebalancing the portfolio and revisiting the financial plan every year. We work with people and life happens. It, I don't think I've ever seen someone do a financial plan and next 10, 20, 30 years, we just kind of follow that plan because nothing has changed. Life is changing all the time and we always have to adapt and update the plan. When it comes to just getting back to the portfolio, one thing is you want to avoid concentration. You don't want to pick one company or one sector. Um, you don't want to take big bets believing, oh, this is, this is at an all-time low. Let me put all my money there because what if things don't recover? You want to be you want to be planning for multiple outcomes. What if this is a prolonged recession? What if this is what's called a V-shaped recovery, where we have a quick recovery in the next several months? Or what if it takes a long time? You want to make sure that you've got a plan that's in place that can get you through multiple outcomes, because no one really knows exactly what's going to happen. If I had to venture out and say what is going to happen, I do believe we will recover, and it's going to take time, and we're going to see some pain along the way and avoid emotional decisions. Um, I saw it in 2008, 2009, people panicked, people went to cash. Unfortunately, many of them did not get back to the investment market portfolio because they watched things recover. And if you miss some of the best days, like for example, last week, we had one of the best couple of days since I believe 1933. I know people that got out just a few days earlier and said, let me wait for things to recover. And now things are higher. Now, who's to say things won't go lower next week? Nobody knows. And I don't know anyone that knows anybody that really knows what's going to happen. So what I do know is staying the course, staying balanced, not trying to be, not trying to outsmart the market uh, and just trying to participate and partner with the market, I think is a smart way to go, especially if you have time on your side. 
So to be clear, because a lot of people don't know about this, you want a fiduciary, not a broker. And if you ask the person that's helping you with your investments what they are and they tell you they're both, that's not acceptable either. You only want a fiduciary, especially right now, because some of these firms are going to want their brokers to charge behind the scenes the highest rate of return for them. And so you want a fiduciary. And so to be clear, if, you know, you know, John Doe somewhere in this country has saved up $10,000 and is, you know, receiving his unemployment and feels that he can ride it out right now and wants to throw, you know, a thousand or two of that savings into the market so he can benefit from it at this time, the best plan is to invest in the S&P 500 index fund. It's a place to start. The reason I use the S&P 500 is it's 500 of the largest companies in the United States. Now, having said that, for the John Doe, who wants to put some of his money, we don't know what his objectives are. Maybe a portion of that is for a tax bill that he owes in next April. I would not recommend any of those that funds going into the S&P 500 index. You want to have at least a five plus year, seven year horizon for whatever money that you're putting in the stock market and for funds that you need in the near term. You want to be sitting in FDI insured CDs or money market investments where there's no risk that you're taking because you know that the funds will be there when you need it. However, if you don't need the funds for many years, then the S&P 500 could be the foundation of a diversified portfolio, but you want to own the S&P 400, which is the mid cap companies, the S&P 600, which is your, the small cap companies, small capitalized companies. Then you want to be looking at the international markets and the emerging markets. So we've got an entire globe of investment opportunities. I can appreciate why someone would want to have a bias towards the United States, um, but just having that globally diversified portfolio will allow you to diversify the risk beyond the United States. And how do you approach the global investments? What is the, so again, the market for that? What is that called? So once again, we use index funds as well, too. There is the MSCI EFA and there's the MSCI Emerging Markets Indexes. Again, not to get too technical, but a good fiduciary um, can kind of help you, A, come up with a plan, B, make sure you're picking the right investment funds and, and the right allocation. You know, everything is all about how you're diversified and how you're allocated between stocks and bonds and real estate. And, that, and one of the things that you wanna ask the advisor, if you're interviewing an advisor or you're working with an existing advisor, and you're not sure, there might be a friend, there might be someone you've been working for the last 15, 20 years. How do you find out if they're a broker or a fiduciary? You just have to ask them one very simple technical question. It's, and it's a yes or no answer is, are you affiliated with a broker dealer? Okay. So very simple. Are you affiliated with a broker dealer? And it's a yes or no. And if they are affiliated, it doesn't make them wrong, but it just should alert you to know that they are allowed to receive commissions or incentives um, and they don't have to act in your best interest. They have to provide you investment advice that's suitable, but it does not have to be, if they're not legally obligated to act in your best interest. So it's just a fair technical question that I believe as people become more educated and Tony's books were teaching that specific question to the readers. And I believe a lot of people benefited from some of the content in those books. <laughs> Hello. So, me yeah, too. Something, <laughs> something to consider. Yeah, those books helped me so much. Um, I wonder also, AJ, for the person who, you know, lost their job, uh, or for you know, for the family, the the two breadwinners in the home lost their jobs. They've got kids, and um, but they own their home. What can they do to set themselves up for success for this next year, um, so that they're safe? So if they lost, let's just talk about if you own your home and you have equity, meaning you owe less to the bank than what you believe the value of the property is. Uh, so if you've lost your job, it might be a little bit harder to access the funds inside the home. But what a lot of people are doing right now is they're looking around and they're preparing. What if this is a prolonged recession? Mm -hmm. What if I'm not able to either working or not working? What if I don't have enough savings to maintain the bare essentials, bare essentials for my family over the next six months, three months, one year. So what you could do is you could reach out to your bank and say, I'd like to A, refinance my mortgage. Rates have come down uh, depending on when you last refinanced your mortgage. So number one, there might be ways for you to reduce your monthly mortgage payment by reaching out to the bank. 
uh, number two, if necessary. And if it's one of your last resorts, you could maybe do a refinance and, and pull some cash out of the home and just put that into what I'd call a rainy day fund. Uh, you don't have to use those funds, but if you're able to pull out 10, 20, 30, $100,000 from the home and put it into a, a, an, a, an account where you could just save those funds for future grocery bills, future utilities, uh, medical bills, at least it's something that you can access. And please do note that there's so much volume right now going on with all the banks and across across the country that to if you did want to refinance your home to either get a lower rate or pull some money out, I'm seeing things last at least 60 days or 90 days before the actual loan proceeds come out. What I would also not recommend is if you do pull that money out, this is not the time to be going out and getting things that you don't need, like a new car or, or, or speculating or taking unnecessary risk with the stock market. Do remember, these are borrowed funds. And if you're doing this, it's really for preparing for emergency circumstances like we're going through right now. And you can also do a line of credit, right? Yeah, that's a great point, Maria. So because with the you equity, go- you have to pay an interest rate. So if you're going to pull money out of your mortgage for a rainy day slush fund, God forbid, I don't have work and I need to keep feeding my family and bare essentials, um, you're going to have to pay a percentage on the money you take out. So it's your safety nest, but you are paying for that safety nest. However, if you get a line of credit, you don't need to pay anything. That's correct, Maria. That's a great point. If you don't need any of those funds right now and you don't want to pull the money out of your home, but getting a line of credit from the equity that's in your home, it's basically you get a checkbook and you could borrow against your home and in the future if you need to. Now, the interest rate might be a little bit higher than maybe getting a fixed mortgage and pulling money out. But if there's a high probability that you don't need the money, then a line of credit makes a lot of sense. And if you do need the money, you pull the money out you pay the interest rate for the period that you need it. And if you're able to pay the loan down, the interest, the interest payment goes away. So it's a really nice solution. I look at that as almost like a cash management tool. You, if you don't need it, you don't touch it. And if you do need it, you use it for the short time period that you need it. And then you pay it back as quickly as you can. And once again, the same principles apply. Don't go out and spend that money on things that you absolutely don't need. This is not the right time to be buying a new car, upgrading the wardrobe, or buying things that you absolutely don't need. Mm-hmm. A quick really note: for food and emergency and healthcare needs that you need. Yeah, and a quick note on the equity. So the one thing to also um, make sure you're getting when you do that new um, equity line is uh, a no pre, uh, no early payment, um, no pre penalty payment. What, what is it called? Penalty. No, no pre payment penalty. Pre payment penalty. Pre-payment penalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you want to make so, sure you have that. Oftentimes that's negotiable. So you want to make sure if you're pulling money out of your home or you're getting a line of credit, you just want to make sure that you have the capability to pay down the loan without having to pay a penalty. Yeah, because if you pull the money out and then all of a sudden June comes and you didn't need it or you didn't need most of it and you want to, you know, stop paying that, you know, $500 a month or whatever it is you're paying to keep that nest egg, you want to be able to pay it off and not have a penalty. So don't forget the prepayment penalty um, clause in there. But then going back to the line of credit, explain to people when a line of credit could be pulled because you don't want to just rely on a line of credit because sometimes the banks will pull it. And I want you to explain that little nuance there for people. So what happened in 2008, 2009 during the real estate crash or the Great Recession is people already had lines of credit against their homes. And it was, and the line of credit was given to them based upon the value of their homes. And when the real estate market started pretty much crashing in that, in that 2000, 2009, banks started coming up and looking at people's homes and said, you know what, your home is worth a lot less now than it was before. We're reducing how much you can borrow against your line of credit. Oh, we're not giving you access to your line of credit anymore because the property has dropped so much in value. So that's one of the negative things of a line of credit that if you feel that maybe I sh- I've seen some people do a little bit of both. I've seen some people pull money out of, by refinancing their homes and getting pulling cash out that they know that can't be pulled because they got the money pulled out of the house. And then they're also setting up a line of credit as a backup plan, an amount where they probably won't need. But if they did, they can go to it. And if for any reason the line of credit was reduced or if it was shut off, 
it's not the end of the world because you were able to pull some cash out from your primary mortgage. So is there a calculation that you should do to decide the line of credit for yourself so that you know it wouldn't be pulled, perhaps? So depending on the value of the home, most banks have a specific what's called a loan to value ratio, meaning what is the amount of loan versus the value of your home? So if you have, I'm going to use around, let's just say you have a $500,000 home that you believe is the true value. You want to be conservative right now when you're trying to guess what the value of your home is before you hire an appraiser. And if you wanted to borrow $250,000 against the home, that would be a 50% loan to value because 250,000 represents 50% loan to value in a $500,000 home. Typically I've seen banks at that level, they will go up to 75 or 80% loan to value. That's typically some banks are lower, some banks are higher, but typically, so you want to make sure that if you are getting a, a loan to value, you probably do not want to be above 75 or 80% loan to value. And when I say loan to value, it's your primary mortgage and your line of credit added. So it comes to cumulative loan to value. So CLTV, cumulative loan to value. So if you think that you're much higher than the, the loan to value of 75%, don't be surprised uh, because the banks did it in the uh, 10 years ago, that the bank comes back and says, we're reducing the value of your home. Sorry, we're reducing the value of your line of credit that you have access to. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, when it comes to leverage, you want to be very thoughtful. This I, I do not want to encourage borrowing uh, for any other reason other than to get through dire economic circumstances. Once again, healthcare needs, emergency needs, feeding the family, but you really want to be thoughtful. Leverage or, or loans is what gets people in trouble. You know, right now, people that have large credit card balances, large payments that might have been living beyond their means, those are the people right now. And if they've lost their job uh, right now, those are the people that will have the most difficult time adjusting. So even now, this is a time to buckle up, reduce your expenses. And if you've got savings, try to stretch those savings as long as you possibly can. And also while we're at it, for those that have some of the greatest things come out from difficult crises like this, I always say, don't let a crisis go to waste. You might need to reinvent yourself. We're gonna look back at this period many years from now saying, oh my goodness, some of the greatest companies, some of the greatest innovations, some of the greatest people came out of this crisis. So you need to be looking beyond and be that leader and try not to make decisions out of fear. I know it's easier said than done, but when you go to a place of fear, you're usually not making the most sensible decisions when it comes to your personal finances and the decisions that you're making for your loved ones. Absolutely. Um, I also wonder, so if, if people have those options, right, we're, we're looking at all the options that people have in this moment to help themselves and to help their families. Is there something, um, else that we haven't considered? I mean, um, I had something in my brain a second ago and I lost it, but is there something else that we haven't considered that people can, um, can do to hold themselves over for this time. Like, you know, I also was thinking about people with credit card debt, like you mentioned. And um, if you have credit card debt and you have a high interest rate on those credit cards and you do have some savings, what is the approach there? Should they renegotiate with their credit card company? And have you heard if they are renegotiating rates to lower them and help people? Um, I kind of find them to be the most evil of all, so maybe they're not, but, um, I, I know a lot of friends who are in that position who are, are being advised, pay off the credit cards, but to me, you need your capital right now. Right. So there's no right answer over here, Maria, uh, but it, clearly if you think about it, if you've got a credit card with a $5,000 balance charging you 20% and then you've got $5,000 sitting in your checking account earning zero, clearly you're so tempted to say, why not just pay this off so I don't have to pay this? So that does make sense just with the assumption that you still have access to your credit card and you can go do groceries with it. You can pay some of the utility bills. Probably not a bad thing to think about. Another thing to think about is you could just go on the internet and look for low, low interest rate credit cards or you could do credit card transfer balance. There's lots of credit card companies that offer um, teaser rates where they say, if you transfer your balance from your current credit card to this new credit card, they might give you what a teaser rate, which might be 
as low as zero percent for the six for six months or zero percent for longer than that or much lower rate that might be a way to take advantage short term once again i've seen people uh, transfer their their credit card balances to the card that's charging zero and then within a few months they've charged up their other card back to the full limit so it, it this requires a lot of discipline but transferring existing balances to lower interest rates makes a lot of sense paying some of those credit cards down, especially if your funds are earning close to zero, makes a lot of sense, assuming that you can still use that credit card for you know, expenses that you must spend on in the coming months. Yeah, I'm really glad that we just talked about that because it's almost like for the person who owns the home, here are your options. For the person who doesn't own a home but has credit card debt, that is a savings right there because if you go from 20% to 5% or whatever it is, um, in transferring that debt, that's a massive amount of savings. It's, you know, all these, these are, all these are levers that we could, there's no one lever that could really drastically change your financial picture, but I'll, I'll summarize on a few. If you could transfer a credit card balance that has a 20% rate down to something that's closer to zero, that's one lever. Number two, if you could reach out to your bank and refinance your mortgage and reduce the rate, that's another lever. If you could revisit your portfolio and make sure that you're not doing any panic selling and you're using the safe bonds to rebalance into the equities that have had a big pullback, not only when the market recovers, you'll have more money working for you when the market recovers than when you did on its way down. So that's another lever. If you're a tenant, you can reach out to your landlord and you could speak to them about some type of assistance during this very difficult period. If you're a landlord and you own a property and you think, oh my goodness, there's all these uh, tenants that are not able to pay and I've got this mortgage payment, reach out to your bank. The government has provided programs for this specific situation. Um, so all these, look at your budget, make sure that you, once again, it sounds like a broken record, but just watch the budget because if you could reduce your expenses for the next few months, that's another lever. So if you can take all the, no one solution will fix it. But if you kind of attack all of them and, and many more, all those will help you give you a better chance of getting through this difficult period and allow you to think creatively and not in this place of panic. So you could, if you have to reinvent yourself, be prepared to do that. I think that's amazing. I was about to ask you for your three takeaways and your three tips, and you just gave me like 50 of them. But uh, one thing I want to clarify for the complete novice here, um, when you talk about rebalancing, you explain that very carefully for people who have no idea what that means. Okay. That, you know, so there are people so, who are invested that don't understand all of this. And it took me a long time to even understand it too. So let's just use a very simple example. Say you have a 401k and I'm going to use round numbers. You can have much higher, much lower. But if you have a 401k that has a hundred thousand dollar balance in it now, or it had a hundred thousand dollar balance in it before it went through the last one month. And before, when you did all your planning, you, with your advisor or by yourself, you decided that having a 50, 50 balanced portfolio was the right allocation. Now, what does that mean? 50, 50, again, once again, let's just oversimplify 50% was sitting in stocks and 50% was sitting in bonds. And that's what, what you decided. Now, what if there's a, a 20% correction? So now all of a sudden, you had 50,000 in stocks and 50,000 in bonds. Now, all of a sudden, the 50,000 in stocks is worth 40,000. Now, and now your bonds are worth 50,000 because let's just say they stayed flat. So if you're looking at your original $100,000 portfolio, you're down 10,000 because you're down 10,000 on the 50,000 of stocks. Now, you're looking at your portfolio and you're realizing, wow, you're no longer 50, 50. You know, you're no longer 50% stocks and 50% bonds because your stocks went down tremendously in value. Now, people could do one of three things. The first one, which is the worst case scenario, which is liquidate your portfolio and say, oh my goodness, I'm down 10,000, let me go to cash. I know I don't need this money until I retire 10, 20 years from now, but I don't wanna lose any more. Let me go to cash. That's probably the worst thing because now you've permanently lost capital. Uh, the next best thing to do is say, let me stay invested. I know this has happened before, I've read some books, I understand that markets recover. Let me not do anything. Maybe I just won't look at it for a little while and let the market recover. That's probably not a bad idea. The third best thing, and what I consider the best actionable step that you could take in this environment is to rebalance the portfolio. What does that mean? You have a $90,000 portfolio now. 
and he had 40,000 in stocks because the 50,000 went to 40,000, rebounds back to 50-50, which means take 5,000 of your bonds and add it to stocks. So now all of a sudden, even though you're only at 90,000 right now, 50% of the portfolio is still in stocks. So when the market recovers, not only will your original investment recover, but the new dollars that you added to the portfolio will recover even quickly. So that's called strategic rebalancing. Now, if the portfolio doesn't fluctuate, like I see programs out there that they rebalance once a quarter, once a month, once a year. But if there's no volatility, there's no real reason to rebalance. And sometimes you might have to rebalance three times in one month because there was so much volatility. So to oversimplify, rebalancing means going back to the original target, assuming that that is the right target for you when you do the planning. I love that. Stephen, do you have any questions on that? Um, I'm wondering if you have like a, an account that you just kind of leave it, right? You don't, you don't touch it. You leave it for 12 years. You just kind of have somebody, you have your, your fiduciary looking at it or whatever. How often should you take a look at that account and actively like get your hands in it and move things around? Like, I know you said maybe once or twice a month, but is it bad to just leave it and not touch it for 30 years? Or do you need to have an active hand on it? Actually, once you, so what I encourage clients to do is look at the monthly statements. I've had clients come into the office and they come in with 12 sealed envelopes and it's their 12 statements for the last one year. And then they say, well, I didn't open them because if there was anything important, you would have told me about it. And I said, no, that's not what you need to do. You absolutely should look at your statements, at least on a monthly basis. You should look at the activity and the history so you can understand what transactions have or have not happened. And as far as rebalancing, um, it doesn't have to be once or twice a month or once or twice a year. It's whenever there's tremendous volatility is the time to rebalance. So the idea of having a portfolio not looking at it for five, 10 years, I'd say probably not the best approach as well either. And the idea of rebalancing once a week or once a month, probably not the best approach. I think the best approach is whenever there are times of extreme volatility, that is a really good time to revisit the portfolio and rebounds to the to the original strategy of whatever that was. And everybody has different strategies. Some people are sitting in 100% stocks because they don't need the money for 10, 20, 30 years. And some people might only be sitting in 10, 15% stocks or whatever that number is because they need a large portion of their portfolio in the coming weeks, coming months. And that really needs to be customized to whatever is appropriate for your unique circumstances. Yeah, I think it's about optimizing in those moments. Definitely, you do not want to be doing absolutely nothing. You don't freeze and do nothing. As I'm giving advice to clients, I'm trying to give them advice where we're trying to minimize us making decisions today that we'll regret in three weeks, three months, three years, and 10 years from now. And it's not the easiest thing to do, but it's something that we're trying. Try. Well, I'm glad I just learned that I'm supposed to be opening those envelopes. Shit. Because <laughs> I <laughs> did think exactly that. I was like, AJ's got it. He'll tell me when something needs to be dealt with. So right yeah. now, I'm, I'm curious right now if you are not invested in anything, right? Uh, you're, all your, all your uh, money for investments was liquidated before all this kind of COVID-19 stuff happened. My question is, should you sit on it? Or should you try to get in on some of these, these short sell events? Like right now, you're dealing with every time a new stimulus package is announced, everything jumps up and yeah. then it drops. And right now we're in a drop. So would we take advantage of the drop right now and wait for another stimulus to be announced? Or do you think it's better to just hold off and wait? Well, if you're one of the few very lucky people that liquidated or got a big lump sum of cash, before this entire coronavirus issue happened with the financial markets, then to consider yourself very lucky and few and far in between, number one. Number two, I think it makes a lot of sense for you to take advantage. The market's on sale. The market is the only place where if you go to the local Nordstrom's and you're buying a shirt and they say you get two for the price of one, you're gonna get so excited. You're getting two for the same price. Now, when the market's down and you're getting maybe not two for one, but you're getting a sale, People are frozen and do not want to take advantage of the opportunity. My thinking is, is if you do have cash available and you do not need that cash for many years to follow, that I would come up with a plan and start going into the diversified portfolio. Now, hi history has shown that you should just go in and invest all the cash right away. But I realize 
that sometimes you feel nervous about putting all the cash to work immediately, then maybe you have a systematic plan of putting maybe 25% to work today, maybe another 25% to work next month, another 25% after that and so on. So that way you're never gonna time the bottom, but you also don't wanna miss out on this opportunity right now. So if you go in on a handful of increments, you'll get the average. So this is probably not a, the ideal time to be sitting on a lot of cash and not taking advantage of the buying opportunities, especially if you don't need that cash for the next several years. And if you do need some of that cash, put that cash to the side, keep that in your checking account, so at least you're covered. And the extra cash that you don't need for many years, you wanna take advantage of this recent pullback. Cool, thank you. Absolutely. Um, AJ, we have um, some questions in the chat um, about property taxes due on April 10th. Is there gonna be a grace period? And I believe that the president had mentioned that taxes were being postponed, right? So the filing of your personal income taxes, which is the April 15th deadline, has been pushed out to July 15th. Got it. So that's already happened as far as payments to the government, filing your taxes, filing your tax extensions. It's all been pushed out. Thank goodness, because I know all the CPAs out there are also quarantined right now. And most individuals that need to file, they're going to have to do a little bit of work of getting access to all their tax documents. So I think that's a great decision. In regards to property taxes, maybe there is something in this new package that came out, I'm still reading it right now and trying to interpret all that information. Once again, I highly recommend start, visit the uh, www.irs.gov forward slash coronavirus. I know that there'll be more information. I know that it wasn't updated as of an hour ago, but hopefully they'll be putting a lot of information over there for Americans to go visit to find out exactly what they can and cannot be doing with their taxes. Not only income taxes, but also property taxes. I love it. AJ, I know we have to let you go. Um, last question. How are you getting better during this time? Well, you know, putting aside the, the financial piece, which I'm trying to stay disciplined and trying to stay calm. And I believe I'm built for these type of situations where I try to be level-headed. Uh, I played Monopoly uh, for three <laughs> times in the last one week with my kids, which has been unbelievable. Uh, I played, I kicked the soccer ball in the backyard around with them jumped in the, uh, I wasn't courageous enough to jump in the freezing pool as they did, but I did jump in the jacuzzi with them. So, so spending quality time with my loved ones, reaching out to family and checking in, make sure they're doing well, reaching out to friends and clients to make sure they're doing well. There's been a beautiful connection uh, that's happening right now. And you started off your segment talking about meditation. I know that my dear friend Deepak Chopra and Oprah are starting a 20 day meditation challenge. I think it's 21 day meditation challenge. You might want to look at that. I don't see anything negative about being calm and meditating and reflecting on your life. I think the only good things can come from that. Absolutely. I love it. AJ, thank you so, so much. What an informative episode. And um, I'm just so grateful for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. Have All a great right. day. I'll talk to you soon. You Bye -bye. too. Take care. Um, so... I want to um, also point people, by the way, we've had AJ on the show before, and um, I want to point people to the past episodes with him because, for example, Stephen, I know you've saved some money along the way in life. If you haven't invested in the Vanguard you know, S&P index fund and done that $20 a week that will eventually lead to $320,000 and I think it was 20 years or something. Uh -huh. um, this is a great time to do it, yeah. right? If you have some money and, you know, you feel like you could put $20 aside, there are some really great episodes in there um, where we talked about mortgages. And, you know, another thing you can do is go to an interest only mortgage and take that big sum that you were paying of principal and interest and take it just down to the interest so you could refinance at a lower rate and make it interest only. Um, my God, your mortgage could go down to very, very little right now. So I want you to remember that. And that is in another episode as well. And if you're in a position where you're still working and you do that, you can take that savings and invest it. That was something that I did um, a few years ago. And it has proven to help so much, of course, now with the economy um, being where it is, my portfolio is probably not pretty. I don't want to mm. look. Um, it, might, it might not be as bad as you think. I don't think it's as bad as I think, but I don't want to know regardless because I know that when the economy rebounds, 
everything will go back. Um, and, and there'll be a, a rebuild period because I have read all of these books and I have, you know, become unshakable. I just don't want to ever look at it and get that kick to the gut. Cause there are enough kicks to the gut right now. We <laughs> <laughs> I think just a lot of people need to realize that it's not just people with money that this is an opportunity for. Yeah. It's an opportunity for anyone who's never taken the chance to start investing or start building their 401k because yeah. you can actively get in at a ground floor that we haven't seen this low in a very, very long time. Yep. I consider myself extremely fortunate because I sold all my investments a month before this all happened and I've been waiting on something. So I haven't I didn't use them at all. What do you mean you sold all your investments a month before? I sold all my investments a month before this. You were invested in the market? I was invested in uh, several different things like Amazon. I had some airline stock. I had all sorts of things and I sold it all because I was like this Christmas. I was like, let me just liquidate everything and take a look for a few months because every year up until now, I've noticed that things peak around January and then they fall. And I was like, I don't want anything to fall. Let me get rid of it. And now I've just been waiting for things to fall until I Whoa, buy back. so you yeah. got out on a winning streak. Yeah, I got out with like a 35% increase to Hell my investment. Oh, yeah. Um, that doesn't happen often, so you were lucky. I mean, But I, I think you're right. This is the moment if, you know. Well, and I, I don't have that much money. So it's not like 35% is going to buy me a mansion or buy me a house. But, no, but it's building. Yeah. That's so it. It's all about building little by little. Right now you'll notice the trends, and that's why I wanted to ask AJ is because like, I was watching American Airlines stock and I kind of knew that the stimulus package was going to go through and I wasn't sure how that effect would have on the market because I've never actually lived through something like this before. I remember the bailouts back in the day, but that was the housing market crash. It was a little different. Mm -hmm. So right now, American Airlines stock fell from $17 or it fell from $30 originally. Now it was down to 17 and then two weeks ago it was down to 950 to 10 so I was thinking, well, I could buy it all right now and just wait for it to come back up. But then what if it drops or what if they bankrupt? So I don't. Then the stimulus went through and it raised to $17 and now it's dropping back again to 12 So if, I mean, if, if past history has shown, we've just extended this quarantine for another month. Yeah. We've just extended uh, how long this is going to take to recover. But... The next time we get another stimulus, people are going to have another, again, more faith in the economy and more faith in it coming back. So I would plan around that. I'm not somebody who can give you like years and years of experience, but like every time I've seen something where like that's why when you see like these news announcements like, hey, we're going to open up by, back by Easter when Trump said that. <laughs> everything back up. Yeah. And then, hey, we're going to give this stimulus. <laughs> everything back up. Yeah. And then, hey, everything 30 more days. <laughs> everything down. Yeah. So we're we're actively in this weird free fall versus save the economy free fall system. But because we're in free fall, you can get those deals. You can start making these deals with your banks. You can start getting these investments. And that's why I like what AJ said so valuable is because you need to know how to do it. Yeah. Not so much that you just need to do it. Totally. And don't you think it's going to change your perspective on buying an individual stock now and rather buy the S&P, get the 500 and hedge your bets? Yeah, I mean, I've always been terrified of the individual stock. I just always play with the things that will always win. Like yeah. Amazon's not going anywhere. It's it's never going to go anywhere. So that's like, for me, that's safe. The problem is, is Amazon's volatile 24-7 because its quarterly earnings completely change it. It goes up by $300, then it drops by 300 over the next three months. So like you have to be able to fall asleep with your account looking like it lost eight grand and just knowing that maybe two weeks later it's going to be up 10 grand. Like it's, yeah, it's crazy. We live in a very, very fast paced world right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel extremely fortunate, but my parents weren't as fortunate and a lot of people weren't as fortunate. So, uh, be smart with your money right now is yeah. really what everyone needs to do and don't buy bull crap. And I really hope that this ends this bullcrap spending spree that our that my generation has like i'm sorry but 500 dollars for a leather handbag is not an acceptable expense right now yeah that's what i've always talked about is when is it a really acceptable expense anyway what is the point of it right like think about right now all those chanel bags and all those amazing that what's the point Right? Well, I'm, I'm on your property. I can be your paparazzi if it's, you really need me. <laughs> it's all about your health mm -hmm. 
and your loved ones. And I've been talking about this for the last couple of years. And so I think it's really bringing us back to see that. It's like, this is the only thing that was going to force the entire globe to see that spending time with your loved ones, focusing on your health right now, we're optimizing our health. We're taking our vitamin C, we're taking our zinc, we're taking our D3. Hopefully you all are. If you're not, you better be starting. Um, Focusing on our health and our loved ones is what truly is important at the end of the day, not how many bags you have, right? And so, yeah, I think, I really hope it, you know, it was funny, Kevin years ago was like the bling era is over and there was a change and a shift and then it came back. And so I hope that this helps us all go inward a little bit more and realize what is truly important and really redefining success um, for all of us. And so two things that I want to mention before we end is one, something that we've done historically in this house and we've made it a game, we've gamified it, is spending freezes. So every so often we would do a spending freeze. And I mean down to the, okay, sorry, the nozzle on the hose doesn't work. We're not buying another one. We're just going to use our finger and we're going to, you know, aim and spray like that. Um, We were so psychotic about it and we would just see our expenses just drivel down to nothing. And it is such an important thing to do right now. Um, Kevin is obsessed with getting a coffee maker right now because he's having coffee at home and he thinks that my generic Keurig isn't good enough for him. Um, but that's about the only thing that he is looking at (laughs) spending money on outside of keeping all of you guys employed and, you know, making sure we can keep running after buzz. But, um, but yeah, a spending freeze can be something that you can teach your young ones and, and the people around you, um, that is totally doable. What do you really, really need? I mean, I, I have recently just took to writing down my monthly exp- I think I told you about this. I write, I wrote, created a spreadsheet, um, the black book and everything, wrote down what's the monthly expenses and where they're coming out of my account. And it's really interesting to see, like, okay, if these are my monthly expenses, where the hell else is my money going? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, okay, so, like, things cumulate over time very easily. Ordering out, coffees. Every, like even the Grubhub, like you get like a, okay, get Chipotle one day. Well, then there's the $3 service charge. Then there's the $3 tip. Then there's the delivery fee. It's like, okay, now you've spent $20 on something that if you just spent 15 minutes to go get it, you would have saved half that money. Yeah. Or Um, if you made it at home. Now we're all being forced to cook at home. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty insane. I think just like the coffees a day. Those are those are a big, big one, like five bucks for a coffee every single day. That's and it's inflating your waistline because, as we've discussed on the show before, sugar, they're covered in sugar, even if you get the skinny versions covered in sugar. So how do you do a spending freeze, though, Maria? So a spending freeze is you literally do not buy anything you don't one billion percent need to survive, period. So what's the shopping list look like for that? Um, I mean, listen, food. I, I don't think we, we didn't do anything different with Got food okay. in terms of like, am I going to buy celery or no celery? Um, it was all the other things. Like you don't realize, especially with Amazon now, you're just like, oh, I need it. Click, 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 buy. Click, 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 buy. And so it adds up. You don't really need all that stuff. And then also when you're disorganized, you don't realize, and we have fallen victim to this again recently, where you know, you don't realize you have toothpaste in the other cabinet and you're buying another toothpaste and you know, you're buying now you see it and it's like, Oh, buy a package of four. Well, I should just get four now because I don't want to have to do it again. Well, you already had two in the cabinet over there. Or, I mean, that is a big problem too, is just buying because you don't know what you already have. So this is a great time to just, you know, reorganize, get your stuff into, you know, appropriate spots so that you don't do that. But yeah, the spending freezes have been fun, and um, and I think it's really, really important right now more than ever. The last thing that I want to mention to everybody, and this is something that has been um, something I've done for years, um, is I've put my parents on camera and I've filmed them. I've filmed their life stories, how they met, um, all kinds of things that I wanted to know, what it was like when I was born and what I was like and things that I want to know that, um, 
you know, you may forget in the long run or that you'll want to share with your children someday. And it's been hitting me this weekend more than ever that, um, I wanted to share that with people because you're seeing how quickly this disease can take hold of somebody. And even like that doctor that said, you know, please, before you innovate, make sure you let them have their last words to their family. God forbid something happens. And so I just want to prepare everybody to, to get that on camera and we should be doing it anyway. Um, especially, you know, the elders in our lives who have lived incredible lives, you know, um, our friends, you know, grandfather who's in the hospital right now is, you know, is a, a war veteran and, um, was an amazing, amazing, um, person. And so there are great stories behind everyone's eyes and they belong, um, memorialized in a sense, you know, on camera. So take your iPhone out, put it in front of them. You know, if you have a stand or something, put it in front of them and let them just talk to camera and just interview them. If they, if you want them to say any special messages, they don't want to say in front of you, walk out of the room and film it. I just decided that even though I've done these with my parents in the past, it's been so many years that I'm going to redo it now. And I just think it's important, um, to say things that you're scared to say, say them now, because you just never know what's going to happen in the next minute, in the next hour, in the next day, in the next month. And you don't want to live with regrets. And I know it's awkward sometimes. You know, my dad saw me crying this morning about my friend's grandfather because it's just such a sad time to see people suffering. And he's like, Maria, don't cry. I don't want you to cry if something happens to me. But the truth is, um, sometimes you can feel awkward saying certain things, but just go for it. You have nothing to lose. You have everything to gain by somebody knowing how you feel about them. And, um, and then that gives them an opportunity to tell you how they feel about you. So share those moments, have those moments with the people that you love and, um, and put it on camera so you can have it forever. That is my last thing for today. Um, thank you guys, as always, for joining us. If you could help us by sharing this episode with people that you know need it, and I think there isn't a person alive right now that doesn't need this specific episode, um, please share it with people. We want to get it to as many as we can. Rate, comment, subscribe, um, tell your friends, social that out, whatever you can do to get this message out. Um, I thank you guys so much for taking the time to be with us and for doing that. And Stephen has one last thing. I have a few iTunes reviews I'd like to read. Okay, well, go for it. Because I don't want to leave them out. Yes, please don't. <laughs> Soraya2120 says, one of my faves. I really enjoy this podcast. Maria's fun, cheerful, and genuine. So many topics that no matter what mood I'm in can find one that fits. Serious, fun, informative, and so much more. Aww. And then we have one from Joy Joy of Music says, Maria Menunos is my heroine. Uh, Getting better together has been my go-to every Monday and now each day with the current pandemic mm. we face. I have referred countless friends, colleagues, and family members to her amazingly uplifting and informative podcast. I only once knew Maria as a broadcaster and also a talented dancer on Dancing with the Stars. I have such respect and heartfelt love for all she has been through personally with her own health and her dedication to help others. What an outstanding human being, and I do not use that ter terminology often, if at all. Oh. I truly find joy in how she seeks out relevant guests and topics, especially her shows with guests Trevor Moe and patty stanger <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny one for steven oh man listen would, to the episode you'll know why i would be remiss if i overlooked to give much props to both steph and steven for all their hard work with all of the behind the scenes research and efforts they put in to make the show all that it is i'm so grateful to have maria and getting better to the other in my life thank you oh wow thank you so much and we miss stuff of course too and thank you guys um for those beautiful words um we love you thank you for being a part of our better together community. I hope you guys stay strong and positive. Go out, meditate today, focus on something that brings you joy. And remember it's about our decisions in life. And it doesn't mean we're not going to have our moments. Trust me. How many moments did I have in this show? And how many moments have I had this weekend? Don't be up on yourself. Try to shift out of it as quickly as you can and choose to live in the best state as Tony Robbins has taught us. Thank you guys so much. Be nice people, make good choices and be present. 